Hello and welcome to Newsnight. I am Ladi Akiri Doluale. Thanks for joining us. Our focus remains on the Southeast geopolitical zone on the program today. Ahead of the November 6th governorship election in Anambra State, my guest says a low voter turnout may result from the unprecedented security measures being taken to safeguard lives and property, but that a delicate balance needs to be found for the process to be seen as free, fair and transparent. My guest also says the broader security challenges of the region, though now infused with a tinge of politics, requires a more inclusive strategy to tackle them. Newsnight talks to the Deputy Chairman of the House of Representatives Committee on Niger Delta, the legislator from Imo State, Honorable Henry Wawuba. Honorable Wawuba, thank you for your time. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Ladi. Let's start off uh, in, in your home region, the Southeast. Uh, quite a lot of things happening uh, almost uh, at the same time. Uh, your home state, Imo, uh, not too long ago, witnessed uh, a very grisly incident. Uh, some traditional rulers attending a meeting uh, were attacked, were ambushed, and uh, the report we have is that some of them were, in fact, killed uh, as a result. I'm using that as a point to talk about the security situation in the southeast. It appears that uh, things are not really letting up, are they? Absolutely not, Laddie. Uh, it's very unfortunate and very troublesome. Uh, I'm very worried about uh, the security situation in Nigeria and particularly in the southeast. Um, I really think that for security, we, um, in, in Nigeria, we, we're having it uh, at an all-time high in security. Uh, it's, um, it's actually not a conversation we can actually situate in just one geopolitical zone, unfortunately, at the moment, because as you know, uh, in the north, we, we have uh, insecurity. In the west, we have insecurity. All over the country, there is, it's insecure. Just uh, last week, um, after spending over $800 million to build the Abuja to Kaduna Rail, bandits uh, actually um, uh, you know, uh, attacked the rail line, and uh, explosive devices were released on the, on, on the track. And for the, uh, for the fact that the train continued for another seven miles, uh, only God knows how many people have been killed or kidnapped. Uh, and this is not, um, you know, abated in the southeast and also compounded with the seat-at-home orders by, uh, that are being issued across the southeast and the level of compliance that we're seeing. Uh, unfortunately, Ladi, we, I think that uh, for uh, security conversations can no longer continue to be held in silos. Uh, we need to, to, to deploy long-term measures. We need to look at uh, the, the, the entire security architecture holistically. Um, if, we, if it took us 50 years to get here, then I'm wondering why we think that uh, we can turn the tide or stem the tide against insecurity, insurgency, kidnapping, banditry, whatever form that you see it uh, in a very short time. We need to tackle it comprehensively and uh, the southeast is, is, um, is, is not left behind. Um, in Imo, uh, we've gone from being the most secure state in the southeast to being the least secure state in the southeast. I mean, I think the flashpoint now, uh, the epicenter of insecurity in the southeast, if you ask me, is in my home state of Imo. And I keep asking, how did we get here? And of course, we can sit and talk about the different ways that um, insecurity can enter a society. but. Securing lives and properties is indeed the cardinal uh, point of uh, objective of any uh, government. And at the moment, we're failing woefully across the country. There is the point, though, that, that uh, there is the seeming tension now between state and non-state actors. Uh, you made reference to a seat-at-home order uh, earlier on, and then... Uh, there are a number of other things that are going on. Uh, there was the attack on the Oweri prisons, which uh, I've been told was the start of the spiral of violence uh, in, the start, uh, in the southeast. And then, of course, it has mushroomed and gone into other states, Ebony, Anambra, and so on. And then we have the Anambra governorship elections on the 6th uh, of November. At this point, do you think perhaps the holistic picture you were describing in your answer earlier has to do with 
the state actors coming together regardless of political affiliation, uh, regardless of geographical location, or, or is it a question of an all-inclusive uh, strategy that involves even the non-state actors? Well, you know, again, security is not uh, to be left at the, uh, you know, at the exclusive uh, reserve of a group of Nigerians. I think when we discuss security, we need to discuss it collectively. Uh, I do agree with you the the, the attack on the Imo prisons uh, actually left the entire state, uh, even in a, in a worse-off situation from a security point of view. But I also have to point out that I am somewhat amazed, surprised, and disturbed by the fact that even the state actors seem to comply uh, extensively with the sit-at-home orders. Uh, and so you would have uh, violence erupting for, you know, maybe, I guess, uh, uh, intimidation and violence against people who come out on the days that uh, sit-at-homes have been prescribed. But you, you don't find any state actor, uh, pr uh, you know, going, you know, just parading going around to ensure that uh, people that have the boldness to come out are protected. So you leave the, uh, the, the people uh, to, you know, they're exposed. And so you see the compliance levels are getting increasingly efficient and effective because people are feeling left uh, to fend for themselves and there's no confidence that the state actors will be there to protect them. On the Anambra state uh, elections, I, I think it, it's going to have uh, an impact, certainly. I think voter turnout would, would uh, be diminished. That's my personal opinion. That's what I think from my own analysis. Uh, but I do think that we must hold these elections. Uh, elections are the only credible way to guarantee that the people are able to decide who takes them forward uh, or who leads them. Uh, and I, I think it's... Uh, is the, uh, the form of liberties that are ensured in constitutions. And so I would want to see the elections go forward. And uh, if, if we have to deploy uh, security agencies and be able to contain them uh, from interfering in the electoral process and not being uh, manipulated to, 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 to play or act in favor of any particular candidate, but to ensure that people are able to come out and exercise their franchise uh, freely, then yes, so be it. Let's go ahead. I recall that in the last general elections in the Northeast, where despite the level of insecurity, we were able to carry the elections and we saw the kind of numbers uh, that were returned in the general elections, despite uh, virtually the entire place being on lockdown. I do not see any reason why we cannot hold the elections in the Southeast. I hope and pray that uh, elections will be conducted in as much peaceful as, uh, manner as possible. And uh, we just have to wait it out and see. Now, uh, you know, one of the guests that is sitting uh, where you're sitting now on the program, uh, Dr. Chukwemeka Ezefe, says that this entire spiral uh, of violence in the Southeast has also been colored by politics. Um, if you take a look at it, the Southeast is uh, divided. You've got two PDP states, you've got two APC states, you've got one Africa state being the Anambra uh, that you just talked about. Then, of, of course, he mentioned the battle uh, for the Southeast to produce the president uh, in 2023, and that creating this kind of spiral of violence, he put it down to uh, some actors of the state and some actors which are non-state uh, is to prevent the Southeast from coming together. Uh, they'll be battling insecurity while everybody else gets on with the politics of 2023. Do you see signs that what he's saying is correct? And if that is so, uh, how does one maneuver through? How do you think uh, the people should maneuver through so that uh, the elections in Anambra can take place and then the elections... Uh, elsewhere, the battle, the political battle, and so on. But can we start with the, is it being tainted by politics? Well, absolutely. Um, you cannot uh, discount the fact that there will always be those that will infiltrate any agitation or any situation to um, advance their own personal gains uh, or agenda. Uh, there will be a bit of politics in it. Uh, there will also be other uh, conversations. For instance, I can tell you, 
that the continued uh, feeling of marginalization or not being included in the current administration across the Southeast also goes to exacerbate the, the, the scenario. Um, I, I, I also think uh, that there's no geopolitical zone that is incapable of producing the president. Uh, as an Igbo man should not be denied the opportunity to uh, be the president of Nigeria just because he's uh, of Igbo extraction. Uh, I believe that Igbos indeed are the, the nucleus uh, of every community you go to in Nigeria. There's Anywhere you go in Nigeria, outside the indigenous people, the next group of people that you find that are holding that place together are Igbos. And if they're able to cement us along the lines of trade and commerce, then certainly politically, giving an Igbo man the mantle to lead this country at this time definitely will bring us closer together more than ever before. I think there's been no better time for an Igbo presidency. Uh, but having said that, I also know that uh, presidency is, uh, is, it will be the end result of uh, a consensus building uh, effort. We need to reach out to other zones. No geopolitical zone can go on its own. We need to lobby. We need to convince and disabuse the minds of other Nigerians for whatever uh, uh, misgivings they may have about the Igbo man leading this country and keeping this country one uh, as one. And let them just let that go and uh, let's get on with the the, the art of nation building. After all, like we say in Parliament, nation building is a joint task, and so all hands must be on deck. I want, I, I want to stay with the issue of insecurity, the justice you mentioned, feelings of marginalization. The Southeast is not the only region that tends to feel marginalized, uh, not just under the current uh, dispensation, but previously. Uh, various zones have claimed one level of marginalization or the other, which brings up the issue of justice but I want to bring up the question of justice with regards uh, to security. Uh, some of those I've spoken to have said that the spiral of uh, uh, insecurity, the spiral of incidents that we have witnessed, ha has a lot to do with the fact that previous infractions have not been punished, the perpetrators have not been brought to book, that so other people watching that feel emboldened uh, to join and to even take it a step uh, further. Now, uh, in order to bring about peace, Absolutely. there are those who are talking about uh, amnesty for those who uh, lay down their arms and surrender to uh, state uh, authorities. Uh, do, you, do you think that could be a way to go across the country? I think that amnesty always works. I mean, President Yaradwa uh, uh, gave amnesty to the, the Niger Delta uh, clamor when uh, they were looking at the issues of environmental degradation and uh, perhaps inclusiveness in terms of uh, revenue, oil revenue, and it worked. It always works. The question, however, for amnesty to, to be effective, you need to have a dialogue. You need to engage. And in engagement, you also need to look at the causes, so what the people are calling for. We must separate criminality from other forms of uh, insecurity. If, uh, if, if, if we are to, to, to look at the anomaly that we have today in Nigeria, uh, to be sure that we do not degenerate into a Hobbesian state uh, or, or just a state where there's uh, total uh, anarchy and chaos, we need to, to have the conversations with groups in a structured manner. And of course, amnesty could be the combination of the outcomes, uh, what we have spoken about and how we want to move forward. Um, rule of law, justice, once you take that and people don't get a sense that they will get justice for whatever their issues are, you are definitely creating a very good environment for any kind of state of play that can emerge. Today, in Nigeria, we, we're having emerging security challenges and we're grappling with looking at solutions. I mean, it's hydra-headed, it's, uh, it's on the spore. Uh, any minute there could be something new from an insecurity perspective, and we're trying so hard to catch up, and that should not be the case. So what is best for Nigeria is to have a level playing field where what is good for the goose is also good for the gander, except we can start to give confidence to Nigerians that we mean business in terms of providing leadership and providing uh, equity uh, that will accommodate everybody with a sense of justice and fair play. I'm afraid we're just scratching and uh, 
we're leaving ourselves open to all forms of uh, criminality and uh, insecurity. Uh, one final question before we leave the Southeast and move on to national issues. Uh, with everything that is going on right across the Southeast, you alluded to it uh, when you talked about the sit at home, there's the violence, the, the attack on state actors and non-state actors uh, coming out to challenge state authority and all of that. Do, do you think that perhaps the state actors, and I go back to the question I asked earlier, do you think perhaps the state actors uh, need to confront this? Otherwise, they are likely to lose the narrative to the non-state actors. Uh, take uh, the prescribed IPOP, for example. The state at home order was issued by IPOP. Uh, in fact, IPOP has also said again that if um, the, its leader, who is currently undergoing trial in Abuja, is not released uh, by November the 4th, uh, there will uh, there'll be one week sit at home, which would probably impact on uh, the uh, election on the 6th of November. So I, I guess the question is, are the state actors, do you think, losing the plot, the narrative, to these non-state actors? Because you've already talked about the fact that even some state actors uh, are complying with instructions from non-state actors. Yes, uh, you see... In the southeast, unfortunately, I think that uh, the, the security architecture is stretched. Uh, I actually don't believe we have enough hands that will secure Nigeria with the level of uh, uh, manpower that we have today, even with the technology that we have today. Bear in mind that the Nigerian military, the Nigerian security forces, the police must engage uh, within codes of international conduct, especially with regards to human rights. Uh, there's so much violence and force and brute force that, that can be deployed against the people. Uh, and so they, 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 they must rely on intelligence. And I really do not think that we have enough to go around. Um, but uh, the compliance level by the state actors does not help matters at all. Uh, I, I don't think it's... Uh, it, it, the optics are wrong, and of course, it doesn't give the confidence. Uh, and so we have things that unfortunately seem and appear to be degenerating rapidly and increasingly instead of getting better. Uh, whether we have confidence that uh, they will be able to secure the Southeast for the elections, um, that, leaves, uh, that remains to be seen. Uh, we need to be uh, definite in some of the things that we do between now and then, but I would want to see a situation where enough uh, uh, security is deployed to guarantee the safety of uh, voters. And I also would like to see the elections go forward on that day. I look forward to, to, to allowing the people of Anambra, because in 2023, Nigeria will be going through a more general election where more states in the Southeast will uh, be participating and of course the security uh, forces will be thinned out and spread thinly over the, the remaining states and if we do not get it right today we're giving the advantage over to the non-state actors to, to try their hands to be you know to actually take uh, matters into their own hands at the detriment of, of, of uh, Nigerians to be honest. Let me bring you to your primary uh, job at the moment now in the legislature uh, and uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the legislative agenda. But before that, uh, let me talk about, because you just talked about elections and the Anambra elections and the general elections. One of the things that um, the National Assembly has been working very hard on is uh, electoral reform, amendments to the electoral laws to make them, in the words of uh, the Senate President and Speaker, more transparent, more credible and easier to follow. Uh, and one of the things that's been done in that regard has to do with the issue of electronic voting uh, and, and possible electronic transmission of results. Uh, many have said the Senate, uh, which opposed uh, this largely before, has come round uh, to this. Uh, do you think uh, if the process is completed, when the process is completed uh, and the president gives his assent to it, if he does in time for the elections, uh, this will improve the process? Uh, of elections going forward, possibly even 2023. So two things, and I'll take it from the last point that you mentioned, Ladi. I think it is critical and very important that the president, uh, that, that we conclude the legislative process and send it off for accent by Mr. President, and it is indeed given. 
Uh, in terms of the electoral and elections and electoral cycles, we can only expect improvements every cycle of elections. I mean, everybody learns from, from experiences. Uh, in Imo State, for instance, what we went through in the last elections will never repeat itself because everybody is wisened up. It's not just about uh, going out there to campaign and making sure that people vote. It's about making sure that the results have integrity embedded in them. Uh, so electronic uh, um, um, transmission and other forms of electronic uh, uh, devices that we can bring in to the elect uh, elect uh, electoral process would obviously be a very big advantage to give credibility to the entire process and to be sure that the people that are voted for end up being sworn in. Um, the foundation of liberty is election. If, if people who have no mandate end up in government positions or end up with power, what it means essentially is that they will be disconnected and have absolutely no responsibility to the people. If you don't come to my local government, you want to be governor, and you don't come to my local government to say to the people, this is why I want to be the governor, and this is, these are the things that I will do, and this is how I will go about it. It essentially means like you can get up one day and decide to fire all your commissioners and your special advisors, like we have, as the case is today in Imo State, for about a year now, it has been a one-man, unitary, sole proprietorship uh, business. Absolutely no uh, structure, no cabinet, no special advisors. The allocation comes, one man takes the decision on his own with a group of people that he has decided to work with. That is what we have. That is what the governor is doing today. No commissioners, everybody sat for about a year because there's been absolutely no connection to the people in terms of the mandate that he's enjoying today. That is what elections provide. And so the Electoral uh, um, uh, Act reform must be, at the end of the day, one that gives confidence to the people that, look, when we engage this time around, the right people will end up in those seats. And that is the only way you can have the accountability, and that will be the nexus, that will be the connection between those that are serving and the things that they say they will do. Otherwise, it's going to be the wild, wild west, a jungle out there. Anybody, everybody for himself, whoever has the most connections, whoever can do the most evil, the most manipulations and fraud, can end up uh, taking advantage of the system, manipulating the system, and ending up in power. And that will be a failure on our part if we allow that to happen. The legislature passed the Petroleum Industry Act, finally, after almost two decades. I remember that... Uh, you and I spoke about that uh, during our conversation. At that time, you expressed the hope that it would happen. Uh, perhaps now, even though there is still a great deal of controversy over some of the provisions of it, but it is in place. And there are those who have said that uh, uh, it can be further amended as time goes on. Are you satisfied with what was eventually passed? Not entirely. But I am proud of the outcomes. I am proud that eventually, having gone through four national assemblies, Nigeria has joined the Committee of Nations to say, look, uh, we have laws that uh, you know, govern the, the petroleum industry and the extractives, to be honest, in this country. I think that we're in a much better place today. Um, the, the Petroleum Industry Bill or the Petroleum Industry Act and the reforms have already started. Uh, it, it, it speaks to our economy, it speaks to our revenues, it speaks to, it's connected to the, 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 the capacity for Nigeria to earn more and uh, to attract more investment. Because as you know, Ladi, uh, the fossil industry is uh, time bound. Uh, in another 20 years, maybe 25, uh, we're going to be, the world would actually be leaving the dirty fuels and embracing more uh, cleaner, forms of energy, and, and therefore we need to maximize. Uh, this is the time to encourage investment so that outputs will be better. Since I've been a parliamentarian, we have always uh, benchmarked our budget around uh, 2, 000, 2, 2 million barrels per day. And that is because we're not having the investment to bring in more rigs and open up more acreages. With the petroleum industry being uh, you know, regulated the way uh, as provided in the Act, obviously investments that are looking for where to go 
would look at Nigeria as a secure environment, come in here, we're getting more rigs. We went from about 30-something rigs to just about five or six rigs operating in the country today. And this is, uh, this is not the way to take advantage of our natural resources in terms of fossil fuels. Our deposits need to be tapped. We need to have access to the gas resources in Nigeria. We need to engage the communities. We need to say, look, okay, we, we have gone from a no law situation to a situation now where we have at least the laws. Uh, if there are, I personally thought that we could have given more to the host communities uh, because after all, they are the golden goose that uh, uh, lay the, the golden egg today. I thought personally we could have given more. Uh, the proposal uh, that came in the bill was uh, 2.5 and when we did the regional dialogues with the stakeholders we came back aggregatedly and said look the people are asking for a minimum of 10 percent uh, as their host community fund and i thought perhaps we could have landed in the middle let's say five percent to start and try it out and see how it goes because ultimately uh, some of these things are aimed at correcting years of imbalance so if you say we've had so much given to the region in the past. Uh, we've had the, so much uh, government interventions by way of the NDDC, the amnesty, the 13% and all of that. But if, yet if you go to the region, you see that there has been some misgovernance, um, uh, misappropriation, uh, maladministration, perhaps fraud, that has still left the area greatly impoverished. So in Parliament, what we do is we interpret these things and look at ways that we can strengthen the laws and see if we can get more intervention going directly to the communities. And that was what is being proposed. We have uh, passed it at 2.5. I will personally put myself uh, forward uh, with a team that will be looking at how we can quickly get that up as soon as possible. But I am glad and proud that the Ninth Assembly has finally broken the jinx uh, and passed this uh, all-important, critical piece of legislation. You mentioned the NDDC in your answer to the last question. That's the Niger Delta Development Commission. Uh, one of the projects I know that you're personally involved in is trying to get the Southeast Development Commission into being. Uh, of course, there's been some horse trading involved in that because other regions also want their own development commissions. Uh, but give us an update, give us a status report on how far uh, that has gone, the project of the Southeast Development Commission. Well, uh, for, as, long as, this, as far as the Southeast Development Commission bill is concerned, we have actually concluded the legislative cycle. Uh, it's just last week uh, passed the, the, it went through to the committee of the whole where we considered the clause by clause uh, provisions in that bill and we passed it and adopted it. So we hope that this time around the bill will be sent to uh, the president and it will receive favorable uh, or a nod this time around. Uh, I have to say though that a lot of regions are clamoring for some kind of development commission. Uh, I know that the Southwest have come forward with one. Uh, I believe this North Central uh, has come forward with one. There's another, uh, I believe, either the South South or the North Central. There's quite a lot of uh, agitation now from the regions to uh, give them one form of a development commission or the other. And again, this would be because as parliamentarians, what we do is we come to the center and we seek to get the best for our regions. Uh, for me, I worked in, on that bill uh, extensively in the 8th Assembly. Uh, we have now managed to pass it again in the 9th Assembly and concluded the cycle in the House of Representatives. We will be holding our hands and lobbying with our colleagues from the other regions to ensure that this bill sees the light of day at the speed of light. Before we go into the legislative agenda, because I know that you are chairman of the House of Reps Ad Hoc Committee on the Legislative Agenda, let me ask you about constituency projects and all the hula baloo, shall we say, that they have generated, uh, both in terms of execution, the alleged corruption uh, that is involved in uh, some of those uh, uh, projects. And then, of course, there are people who say that some of uh, the constituents in the members' uh, constituencies are sometimes galvanized by these constituency projects to move against their, uh, uh, their representatives. Have you witnessed any of that? 
And if so, how is it? Well, I, I, yes and no. Uh, first of all, I think constituency projects uh, are very in, uh, a very important part of our national development today. Uh, there are federal constituencies you go to in Nigeria, and the only sign of any federal presence in that area would be the constituency projects that have been attracted by the, the, the member or the legislator in Abuja. Um, it, we, we can only do more. I think it's a big country, uh, and we have 360 House of Rep members in the House of Representatives. If everybody is able to bring something back, uh, it will help us to turn the narratives on some of the key uh, areas, for instance, education, because if, till today in Nigeria, if you see some of the classrooms that our people, are, our children, uh, uh, are going through, it leaves much to be desired. So constituency projects are very critical. On the other hand, I think that constituency projects also need to be monitored effectively from outside of the parliament. And I'm happy that I've noticed uh, uh, recently I received a letter from a, my, one of my communities asking me the status of uh, the constituency project that I had attracted. And I was like, wow, something is happening. When I read the letter, I saw that it, uh, it had been instigated by budget. So budget goes around the federal constituencies, uh, sensitizes the communities, and through the president generals of the community, ask questions of their legislators to give an update. I think this is very, very critical, because if you don't check anything, people only do what you inspect and not what you expect. So if you, if you don't put these checks and balances in place, uh, only God knows how some of these constituency projects will end up. Luckily for me, I'm happy and confident. I'm proud to say that every project that has been attracted in the budget for my federal constituency has been carried out, deployed. Uh, some of them have uh, been stopped because we obviously need to attract more funds to complete them, but they're all ongoing. And I think that's the second leg of the question. We need more uh, outside of the parliament, more oversight, more inspection, just to be sure that the people are getting what they deserve. Now, coming to the constituency projects in, uh, in particular, in many constituencies, there are those who say that uh, these projects are used by some of those opposed to the members of the House of Representatives who represent those constituencies to galvanize opposition within the constituency to the member. Uh, have you experienced any of that? Absolutely not, but I'm aware that that happens, uh, but that will not deter members uh, of parliament. We can only ask for more. We're all Oliver Twist in parliament. We can never get enough for our people. Uh, the gaps are much. Uh, I, I want to see more schools. I want to see more health centers. I want to see more markets. Some of the markets where the women in the villages are trading uh, is, is a sorry sight. No bathrooms, uh, no conveniences. Some of them are in the open, uh, exposed to the elements. Same for our students. Detail for our infrastructures, even roads. Uh, water, electrification projects, it's, we can't have enough. So regardless of the onslaught from political opponents, we are going to continue marching forward and ensure that we keep attracting more to our people. Now let's go to the legislative agenda itself. Uh, at the start of the 9th Assembly, uh, and even before that, uh, there was this compact between the House of Reps and the people, which uh, Speaker Agbajabi Miller championed, uh, where a particular set of objectives were set out to be achieved. How far has that gone, especially given the challenge that all this is now happening uh, at a time that COVID-19, the pandemic, has disrupted everything and provided challenges even in terms of availability of funds? Well, uh, you know, we called, we tagged our legislative agenda, our contract with Nigerians. And I think that was, that I thought at the time I was discussing with Mr. Speaker, I said, this is a very strong word. But the, uh, the Speaker wanted something that would bind the members of the nationals, members of the House of Representatives to the legislative agenda so that we can deliver. Uh, it's two years now. Um, the legislative agenda suffered its first uh, set back with the outbreak of the coronavirus 2019, that everybody calls COVID-19, uh, we had to come back and rework the legislative agenda and decided to focus on key 
areas, and uh, there were nine, uh, including education, health, security, agriculture, climate change, even house reforms, the economy, uh, and, and even at that, we brought out what we call the low-hanging fruits, and we gave timelines to say, look, these things must be achieved in the short term, which expired in the second, third quarter of 2021, and then we have some long-term objectives. I can say to you that we have not hit 100% of the legislative agenda, obviously not, because uh, first of all, Parliament is just at the midway mark at the, mid at the moment. Um, Mr. Speaker has asked me and the team, he has a, a very strong team of very bright young men uh, supporting uh, at the back end uh, to look at making a report to Nigerians to say, look, the journey so far, how far and how well, and what are the things Nigerians can yet expect before the termination of the Ninth Assembly. Uh, and yes, we have made some uh, impacts. For instance, I can say to you that uh, some of the legislative uh, interventions that we proposed in the health sector, because at the time, uh, COVID was just uh, on board and uh, everything centered on, uh, on health. We, we made a commitment that we're going to move at a minimum a 5% increase on the budget of the health sector. And so in 2020, at, uh, I believe we had about 55 or 59 billion allocated to health. In 2021, we were able to push that to 549 billion, which represented 92% increase. So we smashed our, our target of 5% to provide basic healthcare to Nigerians. And of course, we deployed a lot of resources on the capital uh, expenditure for the health, uh, across the health sector to ensure that we brought healthcare closer to the people. We enacted quite a few important legislations, including the NHS Act, uh, the National Health Act. We try to see how we can strengthen states to tap into some kind of federal grant uh, to strengthen health sector in their regions. Um, and of course, you, are, you remember the controversial um, uh, infectious diseases control bill. Uh, when we're making some of these projections, when we're making some of these uh, projections to the world, uh, everybody screamed in Nigeria that they were draconian. How do you give so much powers, uh, vaccine mandates, face mask mandates, uh, and all of that? But today, the reality across the world is that everything that we proposed in 2020 is now reality on ground. And so we, 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 I don't know, we didn't have a crystal ball, but we were able to look into the future to look at the ways that we can protect Nigeria and insulate ourselves as much as possible from global pandemics. Uh, detail for the security uh, sector, the legislative agenda said, look, we're going to look at security from a holistic perspective and we need to hold hands and connect the dots particularly when it comes to our security operatives on ground with all the overlapping mandates and the lack of coordination. We wanted a situation where if there's uh, a Boko Haram incident in a part of Nigeria, our security architecture is clear on who does what and when. And so we went uh, in April last year, we looked at all the, we looked at about eight bills uh, we did an analysis on those bills, the Police Act, the Armed Forces Act, the Civil Defense Act, EFCC, ICPC, Customs, and all of those acts. We looked at how we could bring some kind of coordination and situate them within a hierarchy with the National Security Advisors Office uh, and the intelligence agencies, DSS, on top, but with a clear form of reporting command and control structure that was hitherto not existent in, in, in our security legislations. Uh, at the end of the after, at the aftermath of the NSAS, we revised the, the Police Service Commission bill uh, because obviously the Police Service Commission is charged with the responsibility of disciplining police officers. And we looked at how we can bring in a structure that disciplines erring officers, particularly from a human rights perspective. I'm very proud of this piece of legislation because we, we held a series of public policy dialogues even before we introduced the bill. So we were able to get all the critical stakeholders on the same page and they made input on the draft piece of legislation. And of course, when the, uh, the bill came on floor of parliament, it just scaled through 
and uh, we, we made those changes and those reforms to be sure that uh, human rights violations are, are catered for in, in our legislation. Ditto for the Human Rights Commission. Uh, this is the first time that the Human Rights Commission, we've been able to provide a seed fund to them to pay victims of human rights abuses some form of compensation. I'm aware that we provided about 500 million naira in the first instance. We will be engaging uh, Mr. Speaker and the leadership of the House in this uh, political, uh, this budget cycle to see how we can strengthen and institutionalize that fund to make sure that people get a sense of uh, succor when things like this happen to them. And, and we, we've actually been doing so much from a legislative perspective, particularly with all the things that we set out to achieve in the budget from the legislative agenda. The rest, obviously, will be the things that we we'll have to do outside in the next two years, uh, things like the reforms of the House to put uh, digitize the processes of bills, uh, the, the bill cycle, the way we work and the way we relate with the media, uh, to recalibrate some of the negative narratives against Parliament, because uh, most Nigerians will tell you that uh, you know, they don't understand the nexus between development and the people that they send. In fact, some constituents actually don't even understand the role of uh, legislators. Uh, they, 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 they assume that we have some executive powers and we're able to perform uh, some of the basic functions that even the local government chairman uh, or the state governors are, are, are charged with. And they don't make the same kind of demands on the, area, on the people who have the mandates, constitutional mandates for that. Uh, instead, they look at uh, their legislators because, again, we are the last mile. We represent the closest to them. We are mandated to have regular interfaces with them, town hall meetings with them. And so we use these opportunities to rub minds. And of course, that leaves us open to very high levels of expectations that are outside our core mandates. The legislative agenda is an ongoing process. It's a work in, pro uh, in the making. There are bills that we're expecting when we come back uh, that we will have to handle collectively and see it as Nigerian, uh, Nigerian, uh, Nigeria-centric bills. Uh, we have the, the waterways uh, bill that we're expecting. Uh, there's, there are other bills that bother with the relationship on the media, uh, these NGOs, uh, uh, so many other pieces of legislation that are coming. But the, 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 the bottom line is that the legislative agenda is a working document that seeks to guide the House of Representatives to ensure that certain specific legislative objectives are met within the timelines that we have, uh, uh, that we have set out for ourselves. It is a contract that we have made with Nigerians, and we, we, we have been enjoying a lot of support uh, from civil society organizations, international development partners, and all of that. We have some challenges, obviously, but I will, at the end of this parliament, be making a recommendation to Mr. Speaker to see how that committee can be transformed from an ad hoc status to a, a permanent status. I can't let you go before talking about the Niger Delta. It's been fairly quiet in the Niger Delta in recent years, but the statistics still show that there's quite a lot of improvement that can be had from the Niger Delta, both in terms of environmental remediation, uh, providing employment for people, developing the economy and tapping into uh, what some have called the uh, unused potentials of that region. Now, there are those who are pointing at that and saying that if we don't act while it is quiet, there might be cause to go back. What do you make of the whole argument and the whole situation with the development of the Niger Delta? Well, the Niger Delta question is the typical Nigerian question. Uh, is a is a question of development. Uh, I'm happy that um, uh, the last time I went to River State, I saw quite. Uh, a lot of developmental strides in the state in terms of the infrastructure between when I went the last time and today. Uh, it really, really, really uh, it pleased me to see the level of uh, infrastructural advancement that had been made uh, for the welfare of the people. But of course, that's on the hard issues, the hardware. On the softer issues, which is the software, which are people issues, uh, the data that we have is still saying that, look, Healthcare is still a very big, uh, there are gaps uh, along 
those areas, uh, education, and so many other indices, human capital uh, indices that we need to also pay specific attention to. Uh, I'm happy to see a decline in terms of restiveness. Uh, I think the presidential amnesty program is indeed a program that is providing some kind of stability across the region. Uh, it is a, is, a, is a program that cannot be toyed with. I'm happy that uh, we are still running that program. Uh, it's still keep providing quite a lot for the ex-agitators. And uh, indeed, if I had my way, I'd be looking at ways to put more resources to ensure that uh, more people benefit from that program. Uh, the Niger Delta, unfortunately, in the NDDC, we still have the issue of organizing the board. Uh, the, the, the commission is one platform that we can use to do far more than uh, we, we are seeing today. Um, we, we, we've had a lot of uh, challenges with the commission in the past. I mean, I've often reported that uh, the rate of abandoned projects that we've seen within the NDDC has been so alarming that in one case there was a, a mortuary that was being constructed that ended up being abandoned. So we not, not only abandoned the living, we also abandoned the dead. Uh, and of course, these are the kind of conversations that we need to turn around and ensure that when we start projects, we complete them. And to that, I just give you an example, the East-West Road. The East-West Road is one critical piece, is a backbone connector across that runs from, I believe it starts from uh, the Aquaibum axis and runs all the way to uh, Edo State, uh, all the way to certainly through River State, Delta State, and all of that. Until today, we are still struggling to complete this road. And what we are seeing now is that because it's taking so long uh, to get this piece of uh, road completed, we're seeing failed portions while contractors are still on, on, on the road. And of course, it's a difficult terrain, waterlogged, uh, with stabilization techniques that need to be uh, different from what, you know, the lateral techniques that we use up north. Uh, and yet, we're not able to provide enough resources to make sure that we can just knock this off and move on to other areas. I think one of the low-hanging fruits that we have in the, uh, the Niger Delta is obviously that we're uh, coastal in, in nature. And I would be looking to see how we can convert this uh, into a very positive uh, thing that we can use to engage some of our youths and put them into some kind of productivity. If you have the coast right there, you know that you have foreign trawlers that are illegally mining and fishing and taking away some of the best shrimps and uh, prawns and other uh, seafood in the world, why can't we form cooperatives and provide trawlers to groups and engage them and bring these products online, put some uh, processing plant right there on, on, on Nigeria and send them out and, and into the international market? That's a low-hanging fruit. That's something that can uh, bring something into the pockets of the people and also earn much needed foreign exchange in Nigeria. The Niger Delta Master Plan it needs as a matter of urgency to be looked at again. And we also need consultative dialogues across the Niger Delta that brings all the stakeholders, including legislators. There's no point making laws for the region when we are not engaging with the stakeholders in the region. Just like we did the regional dialogues with the Petroleum Industry Bill, and we're able to get a sense of what the people wanted. Same uh, must be deployed for the Niger Delta region. We need to sit with everybody on the same table in furtherance of the new legislative and executive relationship that we have been enjoying to ensure that the conversations regarding the Niger Delta are holistic and they are time bound specific, realistic, and achievable. If we can do this, I believe that in a very short time, we'll be able to turn the tides of uh, whatever has been, uh, you know, bedeviling us in the Niger Delta. Honorable Wamoba, thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ladi. Thank you. That's this night. Thanks for watching. Would love to hear from you about this conversation. Our social media handles are on your screen. You can also listen to this and previous episodes of Newsnight via our podcast. Please visit our website, channelstv.com forward slash podcast to get started. I am Ladi Akiri Duluali. Goodbye.